All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start with a little bit of show and tell while we're waiting for the rest of the people to join. So um, behind me on this table, you can see uh, this is a vertebra of the animal we're gonna be talking about today and a skull. And I'm gonna actually, uh, it's a little easier, believe it or not, to pick up the vertebra and get it closer to the camera. It's really heavy. This weighs about 45 or 50 pounds. So this is an, a single backbone of a Bacillosaurus, which is the whale we'll be talking about today. And these figure pretty prominently in the story. But imagine a 65 foot long whale that's got about 100 of these in its backbone. Not all this big, but, but most of them are this large. And this is a relatively small skull. This is really not very large for this particular animal. Uh, you can see from the teeth, they're meat eaters, they, they ate fish, they also ate other whales. Um, and we'll come back and talk about this some more near the end. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and start our talk. So hopefully, you should be able to see All right. So hopefully everybody can see the slideshow. Yeah, I see it. All right. I see it. Okay. So uh, I should have introduced myself. My name is James Lamb. I'm the director of the Black Belt Museum here at the University of West Alabama. And we actually have done a lot of work on fossil whales here and are actually uh, waiting to go dig one up uh, over in Mississippi here in just a few weeks. So our, I've also, knowing that this talk is for a library, I've tried, Elizabeth, to throw in as many literary references as I can. So I hope you appreciate this work. Oh, no. So our story uh, starts, like any good story, on a dark and stormy night, literally, in 1832, uh, after a particularly heavy storm one spring evening, one of these, uh, several of these vertebrae, like the one I just showed you, and like this one, washed out of a little hillside in Louisiana. And they were collected and sent to a man named Richard Harlan. And Richard Harlan at the time, and this point, there were no uh, professional paleontologists. Most paleontologists, people who did paleontology were medical doctors or they were naturalists um, and they had anatomy training, but there really were no professional paleontologists at this point. So his big claim to fame was that he had the largest collection of animal skulls in North America at the time. And the literary tie-in with him is that his brother was the inspiration for Rudyard Kipling's story, The Man Who Would Be King. Uh, which they actually made into a movie with Sean Connery and Michael Caine about 30 years ago. And Harlan uh, looked at this, this vertebra that was sent to him, and he described it as Bacillosaurus, which translates to king of the lizards. And the vertebra was almost two feet long. And we now know that Bacillosaurus, of course, is a whale and a mammal. So it leads one to wonder, how did one of the most gifted anatomists in the United States describe this as a giant lizard? And to explain that, we have to go back and look at the state of knowledge about vertebrate paleontology uh, at the time. So we began in 1780. Um, the first large, obviously extinct mammal uh, found anywhere in the world was um, an animal called a mosasaur. It was found in Belgium. Um, very large ocean-going lizard, it was clearly not something that still lived on the planet, but a reptile. And there's a whole fascinating story about this involving French Revolutionary Army and people hiding this thing behind false walls and the world's first court case establishing uh, mineral rights versus uh, property rights but that's a different story. And then in 1811, the first 
complete ichthyosaur was discovered. And also an ocean going reptile, but again, reptile. And notice if you look at the vertebra on an ichthyosaur, they have a flat end on them, just like the Bacillosaurus vertebra. And there's the skeleton of an ichthyosaur down here on the bottom. And then just a few years later, the first plesiosaur skeleton was found, also an ocean going reptile. It was found in 1821. Notice. Plesiosaurs have vertebrae with nice flat ends on them, right? And there's a plesiosaur skeleton. Now, of interest, and probably most of you didn't know this, the person who found the first complete ichthyosaur and the first complete plesiosaur was Mary Anning. She was a British uh, collector. She was, in fact, the world's first professional fossil collector. You would think it was a man. It was not. It was a woman. She lived in what's called Lyme Regis in the southern coast of England and uh, was a very uh, dedicated collector. And she is also the inspiration for the little ditty. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are she sells, I'm sure. So if she sells seashells on the seashore, then I'm sure she sells seashore sell shells. So that little tongue twister is based on, on her work. And uh, has everybody got a good look at this? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you on this later. Okay, got it? Good. Then in 1839, um, Harlan received some material from Clark County, Alabama. Now Alabama comes into the picture. And he received some more vertebra, some pieces of ribs, a small section of lower jaw, and some teeth from a plantation in Clark County, Alabama. Harlan took these across the ocean to London, to the British Museum, to a man named Richard Owens. And Richard Owens is famous for being the person who coined the word dinosaur. And Owens was perhaps the world's leading anatomist at this point in time. And Owens, especially looking at the teeth, said that no reptile has teeth like this. These are mammalian teeth. And... Uh, he named it Zeuglodon cetoides, which means yoke-toothed and whale-like. The problem is in scientific naming, Bacillosaurus had already been assigned to this animal and had priority. So we got a combination of the genus name Bacillosaurus and Owen's cetoides. And so the new name, the new proper name, which we've been stuck with ever since is Bacillosaurus cetoides, which sort of nonsensically translates into whale-like king of the lizards, even though it's never been a lizard, was always a whale, but we're stuck with this. And you'll still see the word Zeuglodon used in a lot of the older literature, even though it wasn't correct. And this is a fragment of the lower jaw from the Cray of property in Clark County, Alabama, that still exists. Now, in the literature, what's very confusing is that the only person who got credit for this material was Harlan. But in reality, Judge John Crea of Clark County sent the material um, to uh, Timothy Abbott Conrad, who worked for the Geological Survey. He forwarded that to Harlan. Harlan carried it to London, gave it to Owen. Owen looked at some of it, kept some of it in London, gave the rest of it back to a guy named Morton, who, drove, who gave, came back across the Atlantic Ocean and gave it to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And during all this exchange, Crea's name became separated from these fossils and is not reported with specimens. So about five years ago, when I was trying to find photographs of these specimens, which are now at the Academy in Philadelphia, they had no idea who Judge John Crea was. And I actually was able to make sure his name got on the catalog cards as the original collector. There's also some material that appears to have stayed in London and no one really knows where that is. So we fast forward a few more years and there's a man named S.B. Buckley. And Buckley was uh, one of those talented people. He was a principal and a teacher at a school in Wilcox County. He was also a botanist who named a dozen new species of plants. Uh, he was an entomologist who worked on ant species. He was later the state geologist of Texas two different times in the 1870s. But in 1841, he had heard about the whale material that came from Judge Crea's property in Clark County. 
and took a trip to Clark County to see if he could find more and dig it up sort of semi-professionally. And it's kind of agonizing to me because in the 1840s, what had happened is uh, the earliest European settlers who came to Clark County found a landscape that was very wooded, except for a narrow band across the county that was underlain by limestone. And that limestone was the unit that the whales came from and it made grasslands. So they plowed the grasslands first for their crops because it was easier than digging up all these trees. And there was so much erosion that one of the early collectors in the 1840s said you could walk across the entire county from one side to the other and see nothing but bare outcrop. And people were finding these whales just everywhere they looked. So Buckley dug up one vertebral column that was 50 feet long. And he complained in a letter he wrote to a friend that the skull end of it was headed up under a hill. And that was going to be a lot of work. And so he just wasn't going to dig on that anymore. So he collected the 50 feet of vertebra, he numbered them, and he left them on Crea's front porch to be donated to the state of Alabama. So remember that, remember that specimen, we'll come back to that later. He came back the next year and uh, in 1842, and he dug up 26 feet worth of vertebral column, which he later regretted leaving in the ground because they were the nicest preserved vertebrae he said he'd ever seen. But he got about 26 feet worth of vertebrae exposed, and uh, one of his one of one of Crea's field hands hit a different whale with a plow, and came and ran and told him about it. And so Buckley went and dug that specimen up, and it yielded a 65 foot long column of vertebra with a skull and limb material. So that one he decided to dig up. Um, and in some of Buckley's correspondent, he, he records conversations with Crea where all the landowners in Clark, Washington, and Choctaw counties talked about how annoying these big bones were that they would go to plow and hit them with their plows. And so they would purposely destroy them to get them out of the fields. They would throw them along fence rows. Uh, they tried to, to put them in giant fires and kind of turn them into lime to put on, on their plants. Uh, what they didn't realize is that these bones are phosphate and fire is relatively unaffected on them. So one, one person had used them in his fireplace. He had a pair of whale vertebrae, fossil whale vertebrae in his fireplace that he used to prop logs up on. So it's, a, it's, it's hard to say how many were destroyed during the 1840s and 50s uh, just by farmers plowing them up and, and just getting rid of them. Crea also told Buckley, and this is something else that did not make it into the literature until I corrected this about five years ago, that the material he sent to Conrad was not from one whale, but actually three different whales. So it's been in the literature since 1840 something that that was all one individual, and in fact, it was not. So now we get to the 65 foot long specimen. So this specimen had a decent skull and flipper material and uh, Buckley sold it to a man named Ebenezer Emmons, who worked for the New York Geological Survey, who did a brief paper on it and then sold it to the Warren Museum in Boston in about 1847. Now, the Warren Museum was famous for a mastodon skeleton. Uh, it later became famous for the Alabama Basilosaurus, and also a very famous picture, a sketch of a sea serpent seen by a yachting party who also shot at the sea serpent in 1875. And if you remember, this is the height of the whaling era. Sailors are out at sea for two, three, four years. They see things they can't identify. And uh, so sea serpents were sort of uh, rampant, if you will. A few years later, a man named Wood went to the museum, saw the Alabama Basilosaurus, and wrote a paper about it in the Atlantic Monthly in which he claimed that the sea serpent that was being seen with great regularity by these whalers was in fact the Silosaurus, never gone extinct, but there was, that was the source of the sea serpent legends. What's interesting about Buckley's article is it's actually the only images we have of the Alabama specimen. So we have a vertebra, we have what is clearly a complete skull, a complete forelimb, which has never been found for this whale since. Uh, this one's kind of funny. These are upside down. These vertebrae he illustrated upside down. But clearly he was looking at 
a nearly complete whale. So from there, the specimen was sold in 1906 to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And in 2014, I realized that was the last anybody had heard of it was in 1906. It's mentioned in a book written in 1936 about fossil whales. The museum in New York has never displayed it. They've never done anything with it. So I contacted them to see if there was any possibility of getting it back to Alabama. And they couldn't find it. It's missing. 65 foot long whale, and they have no idea where it is. They know it was there in 1936. They sent me copies of catalog cards. Uh, but when they did the last comprehensive inventory of the collection about 30 years ago, it was not there. They looked for weeks for any record of its existence, but other than the catalog card could find nothing. Um, pretty hard to misplace a 65 foot long whale with two foot long vertebra. They even went and looked in the basement where the dinosaurs are stored just in case it got put there because it's so big. And again, could not find it. My suspicion is that uh, the book that listed it, this book about fossil whales of the world, it's published in 1936. And most paleontologists would not have known of this specimen until that book was published. And in the 30s, as it turns out, most of the Alabama whale material was in the museum in Berlin, Germany. My suspicion is that it got traded for a specimen from Berlin. And then just a few years later, World War II started, and it was not seen as being very uh, patriotic to have, to have done this deal with a German museum, and they sort of deep-sixed all the records of that transaction. I can't prove that, but it's the only thing that makes sense to me. Um, the museum in New York City is very good about record keeping. They have a staff member who does nothing but keep track of their records. So if the records aren't there, it means they were purposely destroyed. So something funny happened to that whale, and it's probably not around anymore. Next up, and here we have these two young people. This is myself and my wife taken just, just last year, uh, huh, taken about uh, 30 years ago. And we're at the tombstone of a Dr. Albert Koch. And Koch was a very um, colorful character who was a Bavarian. He came over to the U.S. in 1826. And he was P.T. Barnum before there was a P.T. Barnum. So he arrived in St. Louis in 1826 and ended up with uh, William Clark of Lewis and Clark, a collection of American Indian paraphernalia, which it turns out was not stolen by William Clark or uh, Albert Cope, but that's, a, again, another long and crazy story. And in his museum in St. Louis, he had Egyptian mummies. He had Native American mummies from a cave in Kentucky. He had dioramas of the French Revolution, Napoleon's battles, uh, wax figures of all sorts of people, stuffed birds. He had five live alligators, uh, one of which got loose and plummeted to its death from a third floor window, prompting one local reporter to quip that it was trying to get loose and committed suicide. He has a show that features Master Platt, the ventriloquist, the great Persian Kula, whoever that is, the Chapman family singers, and a feast of miracles staged by Miss Zelena Ka Nirana, the Perry of the Caspian, and her father, the professor of Hindu desiology, and all of that was 25 cents admittance. And if anybody can tell me what desiology means, I'll buy you a donut, because I have been totally unable to find this word in English usage anymore. I think it means mythology or something to that effect, but um, I, I literally have not been able to, you'll see it in the 19th century, uh, but never quite defined. Something like mysticism, maybe. So Koch operated this museum in St. Louis for a number of years, wasn't really making a lot of money. And then in 1838, in a salt spring in Missouri, a farmer hit some bones while digging a well. And we think this was a ground sloth that was buried upright in a natural salt spring where it got trapped. The upper part of the bones were burned 
and there were stone Aboriginal tools associated. And Coke correctly uh, ascertained that uh, Native Americans had come across this sloth 10,000 years ago or more and uh, found it trapped. They had cooked it in place. That's why the bones were burned. The bones in the lower part of the animal that were still buried in mud, of course, couldn't be burned. And the reason there were stone tools there is they were, they were flensing the carcass. But because of Coke's reputation for being a, a showman, this claim was ignored. This was the first record of humans and Ice Age animals ever to be made. And it was another 100 years before it was uh, proven correct. And there's the only known illustration of one of those uh, spear points found associated with that ground sloth. We don't know where the originals are. They've been missing for many, many years. So this produced a lot of interest. And so the following summer, he went and checked out another salt spring in the area and excavated this thing, which he called the Missourium which looks like a kind of a garden variety mastodon. But if you'll notice, it's extremely long and the tusks are kind of turned at a very strange angle. Uh, the feet are not quite right. And this is kind of a presage of things to come with coat. Uh, adding in a little extra here in the vertebral column to make it bigger. And here is Coke's real claim to fame. He reconstructs this thing Here's a reconstruction showing how large it is with the human standing underneath it. And he takes it on tour. And he talks about how big it was that an Asian elephant could walk underneath it unimpeded. And this is a playbill from one of his advertisements. Uh, he calls it the Missouri Leviathan, the Leviathan Missouriensis. And uh, compares it to the whale, the crocodile, and the Leviathan seen in the Bible and says the mammoth and the iguanodon could no doubt have walked between its enormous legs, had webbed feet, doesn't seem right, but he took it throughout the U.S. and drew enormous crowds. Really, it was the first sort of big venue in the U.S. where people just came to see this thing. He took it to Europe, uh, toured Europe with it, also made a lot of money in Europe, ends up selling it to the British Museum for $2,000, which was a lot of money in that day, plus $1,000 a year for the rest of his life. British Museum took it apart, put it back together as a garden variety mastodon, and here it is in the British Museum standing there to this very day, reconstructed properly. But Koch took note of this. This was financially way more successful than his museum had ever been. So we have one record of this. This is a, a panorama this was a, a 19th century uh, phenomenon that has now faded. So a panorama was a giant painting. In this case, the panorama of the monumental grandeur of the Mississippi Valley was about 30 feet in width and about eight feet tall. And it was a giant oil painting and it was mounted on two vertical rollers. And somebody would stand in front of the painting and lecture about it as assistants very slowly rolled up one of the rolls and the painting scrolled away behind you. And down very small in the bottom of one corner of this painting, you can see the only known depiction of Albert Koch. He's talking to an archeologist and showing them his, his uh, giant ground sloth excavation. So Koch hears about the whales in Alabama and thinks, wow, if I could do that with a mastodon, what could I do with a really giant whale? So he comes to Alabama in 1845, and he arrives just after Judge Crea has died. So you remember the 50 feet worth of vertebrae that were left on Crea's front porch that were supposed to be donated to the state? Well, Crea's not there, so Coke bribes the foreman of the plantation to acquire the 50 feet worth of vertebrae and hauls them off. Um, while he's digging in the area, he hears of a, quote, 90-foot-long stone shark near the old Washington courthouse and realizes it can't be a stone shark. It's got to be a, a giant whale. And a young boy named Daniel Williamson shows him where the specimen is. And I want you to remember Daniel Williamson because he comes back into the story about 60 years later. Coke arrives at old Washington courthouse 
and it's disputed exactly where it is, but it shows up on a lot of maps of the period. And what's telling is it's always connected to the same uh, towns by road. So we pretty much know where Old Washington Courthouse was. And note that right next to Old Washington Courthouse is Centibogue Creek. And we'll come back to Centibogue Creek in a minute as well. But this area is where Coke is digging and also where a number of other whales were found later. Multiple whales around Old Washington. And again, because you can go from Isney through Old Washington to Pleasant Valley to St. Stephen's, we know it was on this road. That road still exists. Here's the road from Coffeeville. So we pretty much know where this site is. And again, right next to Centibo Creek. Now, what's interesting is that Centibo or Centibok in Choctaw means Snake Creek. So look at this animal. There's a Bacillosaurus skeleton. It's this ridiculously elongated, stretched out vertebral column. You can barely see the tiny little hind leg there. So if you didn't see a forelimb, which is hard to preserve, the bones don't preserve well, that's easy to miss. You see this long, elongated eel-like skeleton and this thing, and people always mistake these for snakes. Wherever you go where these are found, here are people in Egypt, they always walk up and say, wow, it's a really big snake. So I think that the Choctaw legend of Senti Lapita, which is one of their native gods that is uh, early white settlers reported that it was a giant snake with a predatory mammal skull. I think that was a Bacillosaurus, that Choctaws saw Bacillosaurus skeletons in that area where so many have been found and their native god is, is based on this, this idea of a Bacillosaurus skeleton, which is kind of cool. So Coke digs up this, this uh, extremely long, not 90 feet long, but, but big whale here at Old Washington Courthouse. He works on it for weeks. He gets it all ready and comes the day when the steamboat's going to arrive to carry it away and he shows up and all the workmen are dead drunk. They are so drunk that Coke is forced to load the specimen by himself and is forced to break the skull into pieces small enough that he can carry on his own. So typical workman of the day. Coke gets on a train going back to New York City and gets the news a week later that the steamship carrying his bones has exploded. This was very common in the 19th century. There's a boiler explosion, completely destroys the boat, everything sank, all the car goes on the bottom of the river. And he pretty much thinks, well, there can't be any hope I'll ever recover that after all that work. And so he's very surprised when a few weeks later, he gets a telegram that his crates are sitting at the dock waiting on him. So they had sent divers down to recover all of the client's cargo. And I, I always think that the divers probably thought, you know, if there was a big boxes of, of bones, big boxes of rocks, then they would have just left them down there. But he did, it, he did get the specimen back. He assembled it into a giant 114 foot long composite. So what Coke would do when he was in Alabama, he had his 50 feet of vertebra from Crea's property. He had the specimen from all Washington courthouse he dug up. He would go around with an empty wagon talking to farmers and say, hey, have you ever seen these big chunks of bone like this, these big rocks? And a lot of the farmers go, oh yeah, I throw those along my fence row so I don't hit them with the plow anymore. And he would just go pay them 50 cents or a dollar and pick up as many vertebrae as he could carry and load in the wagon. So he assembled all these things from multiple different individuals into something that was 114 foot long that he claimed to be in print to be 140 feet long. And he named it Hydrargos Silomani, meaning water master of Silomon. Now Silomon was a scientist and he didn't want this thing named after him because he realized it was horrible and not accurate. So he hastily declined. So, uh, Coke renamed it Hydrargos Harlani, and Harlani had now passed away and was unable to decline having the thing named in his honor. And what does Coke do with this? He takes it on tour. And he once again builds this as the Leviathan seen in the Bible and documents it as the sovereign master and greatest monument of all creation. And I love the playbill, right? Hydrargos, and here it is 
reconstructed like it's a giant snake, not so much like a whale, but leaving all the ribs out, making it very snake-like. Uh, he claims it was 30 feet in circumference and weighed 200 tons. So what weighs 200 tons? Any guesses what weighs 200 tons? That weighs 200 tons. It's a little bit of exaggeration on his part. Probably not as massive as the Sphinx from Egypt. Big, but not that big. But Koch tours this all over the U.S. to great acclaim. Uh, he takes it to Europe and tours it. He ends up selling it to the King of Prussia in exchange for a lifetime pension. The Royal Anatomical Museum in Berlin takes it apart, discovers it's made of no fewer than five individual whales. There's four different skulls in the mouth, including in the roof of the mouth, the entire skull of a smaller type of whale called Zygariza. <laughs> And this material, what's left of it, is still in Berlin to this day, although most of it was destroyed by Allied bombing in World War II. And for my entire career, I had been told that, and everybody else, that, that none of the Alabama material had survived the bombing. And, um, and then one of my colleagues here at the museum, Brian Mass, discovered a post that somebody made just a few years ago. And here's the museum in Berlin, and that shelf is all whale material from Alabama collected from coat specimens. In fact, if you look very carefully, you can see on the label it says Alabama right here. And that's what's, it, that's what's left of Coke's 114-foot composite specimen. Uh, here's a couple of individual bones. You can see this lower jaw fragment says Alabama on it. There's a tooth. So there is actually some of it still in existence, and uh, we have uh, an arrangement to get some of this digitized, 3D scanned, so we can print it and have copies of some of this material. Well, th this worked out so well for Coke, they thought, well, you know, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to come back and find another one. So he came back and toured uh, uh, Southwest Alabama in 1846. He collects several more whales and assembles a 96 foot long composite. He tours the US and Europe. He sold it to the Woods Museum in Chicago in 1863. And that specimen was destroyed by the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871. So you gotta start thinking at this point that these whales have a curse on them. So they have been involved in steamship explosions. They've been destroyed by allied bombing. They've been destroyed by the Great Fire of Chicago. Uh, Coke's original museum in St. Louis was burned up in 1849 when the city of St. Louis burned almost to, to the ground. Uh, so there, there's definitely some kind of curse going on here. But one of the things about Coke's work is it had a definite and lasting effect on the general public. So there was an enormous impression made upon the public psyche by these enormous beasts. And these are really before most of the early dinosaur discoveries and certainly before the earliest uh, dinosaur reconstructions. This, and another strange literary illusion, this is a U.S. postal rider crossing the Atlantic in record time riding a Bacillosaurus. And behind him is the Aurora, which was the steamship which at the time held the record for the transatlantic crossing. And here's the Flying Dutchman of legend. And here is the postal rider on Bacillosaurus racing ahead of all of them. This is the only known artwork from Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick. Melville had just written one of his first novels. His brother was the, his literary agent, and they thought selling it uh, in Europe would give him a, a, a cachet that uh, an American publisher wouldn't have. So they were writing letters back and forth, and he was always griping about how long it took the post to get across and get these letters. And he saw one of Coates' displays in Boston of the Alabama whale and came up with this picture, only known artwork of Herman Melville and it's a Bacillosaurus. And in fact, in Moby Dick, there are three chapters in that book that, were, that talk about the Alabama Bacillosaurus specimens. There were also a number of contemporary authors that wrote stories that featured giant rampaging mastodons coming out of burial mounds, Indian burial mounds, and giant whales in their stories. So it was sort of like the, the King Kong and Godzilla of the 19th century. And in fact, several authors have traced the phenomenon of these giant 20th century 
beasts like King Kong and Godzilla directly back to Coke and his mastodon and his Alabama fossil whales. The next entry in our story comes in the late 1890s when a man named Charles Schuchert from the U.S. National Museum, the Smithsonian, came down to near uh, present-day Melbourne in Choctaw County and found two uh, pretty, pretty good bacillosaurus specimens, but there were no overlapping vertebra, and he realized that he didn't have enough whales, so he made a third trip back to Choctaw County and a man named Daniel M. Williamson, who is the boy who showed Coke where that first whale was, showed this guy where another one was. So Daniel M. Williamson, starting out as a lad of about 10 or 11, now in his 60s or 70s, still playing a story in the Alabama uh, whale discoveries. These three specimens were put together and they make up the only actual remains of Bacillosaurus displayed in North America. They are at the U.S. National Museum to this day. They're all from Alabama. The actual location of these excavations, these first two, were lost pretty quickly because um, Melvin didn't exist at the time. There was a, 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 a town named Coco, and all of the literature describes these two specimens as being dug up by the old post office at Coco. So back in the 80s, a number of people, us included, uh, worked at a museum in Birmingham, and we, we went down trying to figure out where this specimen was. And Remington Kellogg, who was the man who wrote the book in the 30s about uh, these whales, he had apparently visited this site in the 30s. We went down and spent several days hacking along this creek bed and, and creek banks with a machete trying to find uh, evidence of this old ghost town. And as we were leaving, we stopped to tell the landowner we were on our way out and we were just chatting with him. And he said, tell me again what you fellas, and this guy was in his late seventies at the time, what, what you guys were looking for? And we said, well, this is you know, a place where a bunch of these whales were found back in the uh, you know, late 1800s. And he goes, yeah, what was that guy's name? Some, some guy with a funny name like uh, Winchester or and I said, do you, do you mean Remington? He said, that's it, Remington. I said, Remington Kellogg? That's it. I said, uh, how did you know about Remington Kell? I goes, oh, well, he stayed with my family in the 30s when, when he came down here. And uh, my daddy, who was one of the guys who helped them dig those whales up, he, he went and showed him where it was. <laughs> and we said, we just spent three days trying to find that. Did, did, did your daddy ever show you where it was? He goes, he turned around to a photograph of his property, an area photograph, said, oh, yeah, it's right there. So he knew where it was the whole time. Uh, so we now actually know where that site was. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of exposure there to go find anymore. But that is the U.S. National Museum specimen that's in D.C. from Alabama. That is the only actual Bacillosaurus remains on display in North America. Uh, in the 1960s, Doug Jones, then of the University of Alabama, dug up part of a small vertebral column, again, near Old Washington Courthouse. And then in the early 80s, I was part of a crew that dug up an incomplete but absolutely enormous bacillosaurus, also from near Old Washington Courthouse. Uh, it is the largest bacillosaurus ever found anywhere in the world, including the hundreds of bacillosaurus that have been found in Egypt. And that specimen, which was my first full-time museum job back in uh, 1984, that specimen is the Alabama State Fossil. Um, I was never, unfortunately, able to complete that restoration because we didn't have a space big enough to finish preparing it. It's still in Birmingham, uh, still has not been finished to this day. Then in about 2006, a specimen was mounted at the University of Alabama. It's a cast, but it only contains one bone from Alabama. The rest of the specimen is from Mississippi on Louisiana. It doesn't have a correct pelvis. I'm not even sure the pelvis is from a whale, and it's almost certainly way too short. To this day, we still have no complete vertebral column for Bacillosaurus satoides, no complete front paddle, no complete hind limb, even though the ones in Egypt have complete hind legs that are only about a foot and a half long. And we actually have no anatomical basis for distinguishing between Bacillosaurus satoides, the Alabama species, and Bacillosaurus isis, the Egyptian species. 
One of the things uh, about this story is this is an incomplete list of all the museums in the world that have Alabama whale material, fossil whale material from Alabama of our state fossil. And again, none on display in Alabama except the specimen made up from pieces of Mississippi and Louisiana. So here at UWA, we've been trying very hard the last few years to actually find one in Alabama so we can keep one here in the state. The problem is no one farms in that part of the state anymore. So uh, the way they used to be found, which is by plow, uh, is really not gonna happen. So we have to get lucky, still looking. We've got one over in Jackson, Mississippi. We're waiting to go uh, see if we can start digging on that here in the next uh, month or two. Now, a little bit of information about Bacillosaurus. So in Egypt, we have a related species called Bacillosaurus isis. They're a little bit smaller, but otherwise very similar. And they literally have hundreds of specimens. They're out in the desert. It's one of the few places in the world you can go and literally sweep the loose sand away and find fossil bones. Um, Bacillosaurus isis is a very interesting animal. So I'm gonna show you on the skull here in a minute. But if you look at the skull, there's this huge crest running the length of the animal. It wraps around the back of the skull and that is all muscle attachment site. Everything in orange and yellow here is one enormous bite force muscle that would concentrate their bite on this tooth right here. And the tip of that tooth experienced 5,000 pounds per square inch of bite force. This is the largest bite force of any mammal, fossil or living. So not surprisingly, they're so much bigger than anything, they pretty much ate whatever they wanted to. We have stomach contents that indicate they uh, fed largely on fish, but there are also uh, the skulls of smaller whales, whales that are still 25 or 30 feet long, that have been cracked like a walnut in a nutcracker. And uh, if you look at the puncture marks in those smaller whale skulls, they match the tooth spacing of a Bacillosaurus. So Bacillosaurus swam up, got that whale's skull sideways in its mouth and just popped its head like an acorn. Um, remarkable, remarkable animals. All right, I'm going to see if I can stop this now. And get us back to the camera. I say I am, here we go. All right, are we back? Yeah, I think so. All right. Any questions? I'm going to go show you the skull here. So hopefully this won't glitch on me again like it did earlier. So here is the skull, the Scylosaurus sequoides, and this huge flange here, and all of that area there was the muscle attachment. That was all one enormous muscle for creating bite force. And all that bite force would be concentrated on this tooth, tip of this tooth, 5,000 pounds. So my car doesn't weigh 5,000 pounds. That's an amazing amount of force for an animal to exert. Um, and again, this is not a particularly large animal. Burn the skull. This eye would be about here. These whales, unlike modern whales, did not have advanced sonar. They had uh, hearing adapted from the water hearing, but not sonar abilities the way modern whales do. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you the uh, tiny little hind leg, but one of the strange things about these whales is that they had, for a 65 foot long whale, they had a hind leg about this long. We're not exactly sure what they did with hind legs that big, but uh, very unusual. And they're not vestigial, they're still using them. They've got, they've got two little toes and uh, 
We know they lived in very, very shallow water and tidal flats. It may be that they're using those legs to kind of steer the back of the animal. You think about something that's 65 feet long, uh, it's a long way from the head back to the end of the tail. So maybe you've got sort of these little helper legs to help kind of push the rear end around and get them around shallow spaces. We're not, not entirely certain what they did with the hind legs. And here again is the, uh, the vertebra. I'm gonna bring this out. <laughs> so, one of the interesting things about South Alabama is there are no hard rocks in South Alabama. It's all sand and clay. So these vertebrae that someone can find would be some of those few hard objects they would encounter. And people used to use these as foundation stones for their houses because they're flat on both ends. It's a, basically a concrete block. And uh, we have many instances recorded of, of people seeing houses propped up on fossil whale vertebrae. Uh, I had a colleague who saw one being used as a doorstop one day, went up to a family's house and they had a small one being used to open, to hold the screen door open. And I saw one a few years ago on top of a chicken shed being used to hold down roofing tent. <laughs> went up to the farmer and I said, um, you know, you could, could, could you not use a concrete block for that? He said, well, I'd have to buy a concrete block. That was free. I said, well, if I buy you a concrete block, can I have that one? Because they're kind of rare. Um, so very strange uses. Uh, there was one report of somebody using one as a pillow. Uh, doesn't make sense to me. Surely there's something better to use as a pillow than, than, than that, but maybe not. All right, questions. Anybody? I still can't believe that all that by force can just be concentrated. In, into mainly that one tooth of the L5,000 pounds of that the tooth just be, being crushed from the pressure it is. Yeah. Look up, look up, uh, go Google things that weigh 5,000 pounds. I mean, there really, there's a lot, a lot of cars that don't weigh 5,000 pounds. So uh, I don't have any good illustrations of the whale skulls at the moment, but literally a skull half that size looks like something's been put in a giant nutcracker and just, just popped. <laughs> So yeah, pretty, pretty fearsome. So whenever I've been asked many times, wouldn't you like to have a, a time machine to go back in time? I was like, no, 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 not unless I had a submarine. <laughs> don't want to swim with these guys. Don't want to run with the dinosaurs. Don't want to swim with the basilosaurus. Just want to kind of study them from, from afar. Yeah, if you had too close, your submarine would be crushed. Maybe, yeah, maybe. It would be a marine before it ate you. Yeah. Did you have something? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, um, I think at one point you were talking about mosasaurs one day, and you said that um, if, like, these things were still around, you said nobody would go to the beach. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't go to the beach. You, you would go to the beach and look at the water, but you wouldn't get in it. Um, you know, um, if dinosaurs were still around, you, nobody would go outside. You know, we'd, 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 we'd hide in our basement. Uh, so... It sounds strange, but I'm actually kind of glad they're extinct because I like going outside. I think that if you were to go back in time and visit the dinosaurs, then the best vehicle to bring would be would be an airplane because you know most of the air dwelling animals just are after the fish, not the other things that fly. Plus, we probably. Plus, if you brought a big enough plane, then you would be the biggest thing in the sky. Nobody would even come close. Airport, though. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, if the lake was in front of you, that wouldn't work. <laughs> nope, some things are very long, and they could just be done. Okay. Well, guys, Bye. thank you. Uh, any more questions about the Solosaurus, fossils in general? All right, guys. Well, thank you. And uh, hopefully you. sometime next year, our museum will be back open again. You can come visit the Black Museum here in, in Livingston at the University of West Alabama. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.